you wherever you are around the globe joining this the second in our series of field fisher webinars on ai um the i am mark weber i'm sat here in a very sunny silicon valley today um al alongside a number of colleagues who i'll introduce in a moment and we're going to talk you through generative ai the privacy risks and the challenges as a part of this wider webinar series that we're uh, embarking upon. Um, we're going to talk about a type of AI on this particular session, that, uh, that is generative AI, technology with impressive human-like um, properties and responses. And broadly, Gen AI is described as a machine learning system capable of generating text, images, code, other content when a prompt is entered. Many of you may have used it. You may have used it in a single form, just generating an image. You may now have used it in a multi multimodal form, generating, say, a presentation with text and maybe audio to accompany it. Um, sometimes you can use that ad hoc, al alone, uh, as you log into a particular system. But many times you may have used it alongside systems you're already familiar with when it's integrated and incorporated into online tools, maybe your email messaging platform, maybe uh, the, uh, the the blogging tool uh, that you're using, which uh, gives you a, a little prompt alongside, or uh, you've, inter you've, you've interacted with a chatbot. Many different ways of using this, and we're going to talk about some of the issues, and particularly the privacy issues and challenges in, in looking at that. In fact, some of the slides in this very webinar have been uh, created with generative AI. Um, this whole endeavor is part of a four-part series. Many of you will have listened to our first session on debunking the EU AI Act uh, back in January. Um, we're here today to talk about generative AI, then looking ahead on the 12th of March, uh, assessing high-risk AI systems under the EU AI Act. A couple of our German and UK partners will be looking at that, and then looking ahead um, from Spain and from Ireland back in April, we'll be looking at AI governance and some of uh, what that governance is uh, and what it should never be. So there's a journey here and you're part of that journey. Um, we are recording these sessions. We will be making the slides available and um, those that have taken place will be there on our YouTube uh, channels and accessible uh, through the web. Uh, and others that are coming, you can listen to live, sign up, and uh, if you can't make it live, uh, we'll also provide you information with how you can find them on our YouTube channel or our AI playlist. So there's a lot, yeah, lot to follow and a lot of AI that's out there. But today I'm joined here um, with Richard Lorne, a senior associate in our tech team here in Silicon Valley, Andrea Ortega. Uh, and also an associate, senior associate in our tech team, and Pardi Denoya, um, also in our tech and data team here in Silicon Valley. So we've got a pretty epic team bringing you some perspective. We've all been immersed in AI even before ChatGPT came on the market in uh, November of 2022, and we've got a lot to share. And um, I'll hand over to Richard to talk about the Pope in a puffy jacket and how we've got into Gen AI in the last few months and years. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Well, looking back over the past 12 months, it's certainly been an incredible journey since ChatGPT took the world by storm at the start of 2023. And we've seen this remarkable growth in the AI landscape, highlighted by the development of a number of new advanced LLMs like GPT-4 and more recently Gemini, as well as the commercial launch of a number of generative AI tools like Copilot and Google's suite of generative AI experiences. And suffice it to say, probably no industry has been left untouched at this point in time. Even the legal sector has felt the impact with platforms like Thomson Reuters incorporating AI assistants and chatbots to help change the way that lawyers work and legal professionals work as well. However, at the same time, the rapid rise of AI and particularly generative AI has also, of course, raised critical discussions around existential threats, as well as more immediate concerns around transparency, bias, and the potential for misuse, illustrated vividly by that famous viral image of Pope Francis wearing that rather fetching Lenciaga jacket. 
Against this backdrop, the legal landscape has also been equally dynamic. So we've had some landmark decisions from courts who are trying to assess how existing laws apply to generative AI, including we had an important decision from the Court of Justice of the European Union in December around automated decision making. But we've also seen regulators respond. So, for example, in January this year, the UK ICO launched a consultation on generative AI and data protection. At the same time, globally, legislative efforts are also intensifying. And several jurisdictions, including Brazil and China, have or are in the process of advancing AI legislation. And of course, we also have the EU's AI Act, uh, touted as the world's first comprehensive legal framework for AI. And the EU reached a historic political agreement on that regulation in December, and we expect the law will be officially adopted in the next few months. What is clear is that generative AI is here to stay and there's plenty more changes and exciting things to come. So while last year, 2023, may be remembered as the year that generative AI exploded onto the scene, this year, 2024, may be the year that we start engaging in more in-depth, nuanced and balanced discussions around the challenges and risks of this technology. And now I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thanks, Richard. So we will be doing a live poll during this webinar. We hope everyone attending this webinar right now are able to join us. Please can you use Slido by scanning the QR code appearing on your screen right now, or uh, as an alternative, you are able to go on slido.com and enter the participant number appearing on the screen right now. So the number is 11278188. And you will be able to view the poll um, once I go onto a, another screen um, in just a moment. So our first poll is, out of these two images appearing right now, which one do you think is fake? So which one do you think is generated by AI? Do you think it's number one? Do you think it's number two? Or do you think both of these images are fake? Please just take a good look right now because um, you'll be able to vote on the next screen. And there will be more of these tests to come throughout the webinar. So if you think this one's easy or if you think you're going to get the answer right, let's see how you do uh, with some of the next ones, which get a little bit more challenging. Yeah, I think pretty much all of them are quite tricky and quite believable. <laughs> let's see. So. Yeah, please um, select your answer now. Which image do you think is fake? That's interesting. We can start to see the responses coming in in real time. Yeah, it seems the majority of participants think the number two is fake. Uh, you know, be honest. Don't let that influence your decision. If you think it's both or one, go for that response as well. Okay, so it seems that the majority of our participants got it right and the second image is actually fake. So well done to everyone who participated. Thank you. Um, Andrea will now go on to explain a bit more about how generative AI works. Thanks, Pradeep. So um, because we're focusing on data protection today, the first important question that we wanted to address is whether the GDPR actually applies to generative AI. And for these purposes, we're going to first explore briefly how generative AI works and whether it generally involves the processing of personal data. So as Mark was saying initially, in simple terms, generative AI is an AI system that creates or generates content. And this could be text, image, audio, video, code, some sort of output based on a huge amount of data that the system has been trained on using machine learning approaches. In some cases, it's using labeled data and in other cases, unlabeled data. The technology is essentially able, for example, to predict the next word based on a previous word sequence or the next pixel based on a previous pixel and therefore create or generate new texts or images. Text generating tools can provide answers to pretty much any question. So for example, they can generate personalized emails or draft interview questions. 
but models can also be created or fine-tuned for specific contexts and for other modalities. So for example, to generate user interface designs or create voice cover for training purposes. And there are a number of other examples in, in the slide. In addition, uh, with multimodal generative AI, it's also possible to create models that support multiple data types, so from text, images, audio, to others, and enable, for example, content creation, customer service, and research and development. Uh, I'm now going to go through the three main buckets of data to be considered when assessing generative AI. So the first, and please we jump to the next slide, is the training data, which is the huge corpus of data involved in actually training the model in the first place. Generally, it's the AI developer or provider that conducts this initial training. So for example, it would be OpenAI. Large language models are normally pre-trained on a variety of publicly available sources from the internet. And given that a large amount of data on the internet relates to individuals, the training data may incidentally include personal data from individuals globally. The second bucket is the input data. So once the AI system has been trained and is ready to be used, the input data is the data that is fed into the model as a prompt. This could be text, images, or the other types of data, and personal data could be collected and fed through the model to make decisions about individuals. Note that even if these are only predictions or inferences about individuals, they will constitute personal data. Finally, the third bucket is the output data. So based on its training and the input, the AI system generates a response or output, and it is possible that it could include also personal data. Note also that models are for the most part always being trained and fine-tuned, and AI users could also be involved in the subsequent training of the AI, particularly if you're looking to improve the model as a user. So in summary, it's important to assess what are the types of data involved and whether there is a personal data element, even if this is incidental, particularly if you do not have control of the training data or what are the inputs and outputs, in which case the GDPR could apply. Now we're going to be looking at the AI supply chain. So this refers to the different actors that are involved. You'll notice I've already mentioned uh, the AI developer provider and the AI user. And Mark and Richard are going to look into this in a bit more detail. Thank you, Pardi. And um, I think I'd really like to ask everybody just to take a moment um, and to explore an issue which really goes to the heart of many of the projects that we're involved in. It also goes to the heart of a lot of confusion when we're talking with, with clients and contacts about their, their AI journeys. Um, and really, you need to get in a bit of a mindset about this. On, the, on this slide, we've got a representation of three core types of AI model. Uh, there's the license and use model, uh, the integrate, use and deploy model or the build model. And for now, I, I think, and for the rest of this webinar, we're probably going to ignore a lot of the build model as many, many will use generative AI, but very few, um, probably very few of those on this call will actually be building their own generative AI models. Right now, this is really the domain of the very large, the open AI, the Google, the Microsoft, the, uh, the XAI, and maybe the Anthropic. Though, yes, there are other models that are being built and maybe trained and adapted, uh, but let's just put building to, to one side. The chances are, if you're using generative AI today, you're either going to be using the license or buy model uh, or the integrate model. And let's just step aside for one moment and realize that AI is just software you're buying technology and there are a number of issues which you need to think about um, as you have over a long time when buying technology. So let's think about the license model. Of course, yeah, you could be buying AI outright, but I think it's very unlikely given the, the level of money going into the development of these models that you, you're off to buy open AI anytime soon. Um, but you, you're likely to be licensing uh, a, a generative AI model where a, a circumstance where a third party has trained, tested and built that model. They're then making it available under license to you and to others subject to a scoped permission within that license. 
you have a license to use and you may be using it with your in your own organization with your employees or just yourself so essentially it's a licensing in then as we're beginning to see and we've seen a lot during the course of the last uh, sort of 16 months there are a number of integrate models again a third party is trained tested and built the gen ai model and they're making that available under license but in this instance the license has a permission allowing a level of sub licensing and distribution and the user then wants to deploy for others to enjoy that gen ai possibly integrated alongside their own technology as i said earlier on you may have your email marketing system which can now integrate gen ai through an api and create um, contextual generated outputs to be pushed out through your email marketing technology. That kind of integration is something that we've seen an awful lot here in Silicon Valley. And we've literally worked with, on you know, you know, you know, a, 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 many, many of those implementations. As Andrea went on and said back on her previous side, there were different flavors of that. Sometimes you may be taking a base model and training it yourself or enhancing it on your own data. And there's some other issues to be thought about there. But you really need to get into that mindset. And the mindset I want you to think about is we're really now in a supply chain issue scenario. The user or deployer is not responsible for building or training the underlying model. Um, they need to approach it in a different way. You didn't build, so how are you responsible for something that you didn't build? You don't know what data is used to train that model, whether the data was fairly obtained, whether it contained personal data, whether that personal data was sensitive data, whether or not it was licensed or just scraped and taken. Was it infringing? What kind of testing had gone, gone on? Is the model reliable? Is it safe? Is it stable? All of these kind of questions you, as a user or an ultimate deployer under the integrate model are going to be dependent on the vendor to answer and within that supply chain you're going to have to do some of your own due diligence it's not for you necessarily to test and explain and explore the way the model works uh, and uh, avoids bias but it may be for your vendor to explain how they've gone about ensuring that and of course you have choice maybe you'll use a different vendor because one vendor can't explain that to you uh, but this kind of stuff matters to you as a user and more so if you're deploying it to your employees or to third parties and customers essentially you're buying tech and we want you to think about that in a supply chain situation it's not necessarily the case that you go off cut and paste the, some standard AI principles and start applying them to your business. More likely, you're going to be thinking about how those business principles work in, in, in terms of your own uh, technology procurement and how you get assurance from a third party in relation to the way that AI was built. So we really need to think about that supply chain and how you evaluate that supply chain. And I'll push on to Richard just to talk a little bit more about those kind of concepts. Yeah, so let's put that into context with the, an example of a typical type of AI supply chain. And this is quite a simplified model, but this gives you an idea of what a typical supply chain might look like in the context of Gen AI. So we have a number of different entities involved, both operating at the upstream level and also at the downstream level. At the top of the upstream, we have organizations like OpenAI who are actually responsible for training and developing the foundational models or the LLMs that are used to help power generative AI capabilities. And typically, these organizations are controllers of personal data that's used during the training and development phase when they are actually building the models. And that's because they're making critical decisions about the data that they use to train their models including the sources of data and parameters guiding the learning processes. However, during the live deployment of the system, they typically act as processors of both the input data that feeds into the model and the output data that's provided back. So during the live deployment, they act more as a um, processor role and merely processing on behalf of the downstream users and customers. Um, however, it's worth noting that potentially they could act as a controller if they actually start mating, making critical decisions about the processing of that input and output data, particularly if they use that data for continuous learning and to train and improve their models. Let's move further downstream. So here we have the actual 
developers or providers of the Gen AI product, tool, or feature. And these are really the integrators that Mark was referring to. So they might be actually building the tool, like a chatbot, text generator, translation tool, or any other system that's actually powered by these LMMs. Now, while they may be actively involved in developing the product, in terms of the data, they may simply act as an intermediary or processor. Particularly, that's gonna be the case if they didn't actually play any role in the training or development of the LLM, and they simply act as a pass-through when the product is processing data during the live deployment. So the input data that's coming in, fire them through to the foundation model at the top, and the output data that's flowing back, again, via them back to the user or deployer. So typically acting in a processor capacity, however, again, they could potentially qualify as a controller if they take on a more active role in making critical decisions about processing. So for example, if that provider or developer actually plays a role in fine tuning or otherwise customizing the foundation model during development, then potentially they could be acting as a controller during that phase. And again, if they're using any of the input data that they get from their downstream customers in order to improve the model or their own product services, again, that could potentially implicate a controller role. Let's move further downstream. So here, this is where we have the user or the deployer. That could be the customer. Um, it includes businesses, organizations that are using AI within their operations, for example, for internal efficiencies or to improve customer experience. And in the, this context, when they're actually using the AI product tool or feature, they're generally gonna be considered a controller of the input data that's coming in and the output data that's provided back, particularly because they're gonna be determining the specifics around what data is actually fed in and what data the AI interacts with during the deployment. And finally, at the end of the chain, we have the end user. So that could be an employee of the user or deployer, or it could actually be the end customers or end clients who actually interact with the system. So what we can see from this model is that we have a continuum of roles and different responsibilities from the upstream level to the downstream level. And what's key is really understanding your place in this supply chain. Are you the user deployer of the AI system or are you the provider or developer? Potentially, although much less likely, you could be acting as that foundational model at the upstream. But as Mark says today, that's more limited to a number of key players. Um, so again, that's just to provide a little bit of context. And now I'll hand over to uh, whoever's next. Ah, Andrea, it's you. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. <laughs> so, there are, we're going to address now the legal frameworks. Um, so there are a few laws that will directly regulate AI and generative AI more specifically. So as you may know, the EU is finalizing the adoption of its AI governance framework, the AI Act. And actually, general purpose AI models and generative AI only became subject to the AI Act at a late stage of the legislative process with the advent of OpenAI's ChatGPT. The current final draft includes, within the more popularized term AI systems, legal definitions for general purpose AI systems, foundation models, and generative AI as well, and establishes specific compliance requirements with a focus on transparency and accountability. The EU is also amending its product liability regime, updating the existing product liability directive, and also proposing a new AI liability directive to harmonize civil liability for AI systems among EU member states. The AI liability directive aims to ensure that individuals who have been harmed by an AI system can receive financial compensation and introduces a rebutable presumption of a causal link between the fault of the provider and the output. It also gives claimants the right to request the court to order the disclosure of details of the workings of the AI model. On the other hand, the UK government has undertaken consultations and invited feedback from the AI industry to guide its regulation of AI practices, so more to come on this front as well. 
In the US, um, there are also increasing attempts to introduce uh, federal law as well as state laws, particularly following the AI executive order issued by the Biden administration in October 2023. Back in 2022, the US Algorithmic Accountability Act was introduced in Congress with the aim of addressing the potential risks associated with automated decision systems. More recently, in November 2023, California proposed regulations on automated decision-making technology, and you may be aware that some states already have final regulations. So, for example, New York has a local law that prohibits employers from using automated employment decision tools to evaluate job candidates or employees when making employment decisions. So we can say that so far the US approach has mostly been framed in terms of automated decision-making technology used to help make decisions or judgments that have a legal material or otherwise significant impact on individuals. The EU's approach in contrast has a more, has a more comprehensive regulatory coverage, both in terms of including more AI applications and promulgating more binding rules for its application, not only through the, through the AI Act, but also other laws such as the EU Digital Services Act, among others. So it looks like the EU will be able to enforce its rulemaking with more clear investigatory powers and significant fines for non-compliance. And finally, beyond the EU and the US, there's many other countries, including Canada, China, India, and Japan, that have proposed AI-related legal frameworks. Last year, um, so this this uh, slide, the photo, was taken from the International Association of Privacy Professionals who published a global AI legislat legislation tracker that you can take online um, for more information. And this is to show that this is definitely a huge growth space and we're going to see a lot more to come. Now, in addition to laws that apply directly to AI and generative AI, obviously there are existing laws that indirectly regulate this technology. So this would include consumer protection, IP, competition, and also data protection laws. And before diving into the EU data protection risks and challenges, I'm going to pass it on to Richard, who's going to speak a bit more about the EU AI Act. Thanks, Andrea. So this is the big blockbuster law that is causing a lot of excitement at the moment. And um, our European colleagues did a, a much um, deeper dive into the EU AI Act during the last webinar in this series. So we're not going to spend too much time on this. But it's worth mentioning that the Act will introduce some new rules around generative AI specifically. And they are really targeted at ensuring there is um, appropriate transparency and disclosures around both um, chatbots and other AI systems that interact with individuals directly, but also around the fact that content generated by artificial intelligence is artificial and, and not real. So just to provide a little brief reminder and outline, first of all, providers of AI systems that interact directly with people must design those systems in a way that people are <clears throat> aware and informed that they are interacting with an AI system, unless it's obvious to a reasonably well-informed user and that that is the case taking into account the circumstances. So for example, that could include um, an AI chatbot. If it's obvious from context, not necessarily needing to provide some kind of disclaimer or disclosure, but if it's not obvious or unclear, then that's where really people should be aware that they're interacting with AI and not a real human being. And then moving on to AI generated content, there's obligations both for providers of systems, but also users of systems as well. So providers of generative AI systems must ensure that outputs are marked or detectable as AI generated or manipulated. So that means that whether it's a piece of text or a media file, et cetera, the fact that it's um, artificially generated should be identifiable or detectable. And those providers also have to make sure that they have implemented appropriate technical standards. So the solutions are effective, interoperable, robust and reliable, et cetera. And there are also rules around deep fakes and also AI tools that generate generate text that's used to inform public on matters of public interest. Again, the main takeaway and point to think through is that there is increased transparency obligations. 
And at this stage, it's still a little unclear as to how people are going to be able to comply with these requirements. And the AI Act envisages that there will be codes of practice for both deployers and users of these systems. Um, and although there is a lot of excitement right now about the EU AI Act, let's not forget that the law hasn't been formally adopted yet, but also many of its rules will not come into immediate effect. And particularly these rules around generative AI are not going to come into effect the day that it's adopted. There is some lead time involved there. So again, if you want to dive into further detail, I suggest you go back to that webinar that's available on the YouTube channel now and our European colleagues talk through those requirements in a little bit more depth. So just like before, um, please can you use Slido to tell us which image out of these two which you think is fake? Um, so do you think it's number one? Do you think it's number two? Or do you think both of these images are fake? Um, if you're joining us now, please use Slido. We have the information in the top um, right corner with the QR code and the website with the participant number to join us. Okay, it seems that there seems to be a tie between number one and both of the images being fake. But it seems the majority of attendees right now think that number one is fake. Mm. And the correct answer is that the first one is actually fake. So it, oh, okay, it just changed right now as well. We're still, still voting. voting. Yeah, still votes voting. are coming in. <laughs> Always vote once you know the answer, that's my motto. <laughs> Could we flip back to the image, Poddy? Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, there, there we can take a second look. I think this one is very close call. Yeah, both of them seem very real. And you'll probably notice that we have not included the hands in these images <laughs> for um, reasons that probably most of you can guess. Hands might give it away <laughs> if we've included them. Let's take another look right now and see how the poll is doing. And okay, so the majority of attendees think that the first image is fake. And yes, that's the correct answer. The first image is fake. It seems that the attendees are doing really well right now. They got the first one right and this one right too. 50-50 with, uh, if you think about both fakes, or, by, or we've got some revoting coming in now. So. Uh, but uh, I think actually the majority were tricked for a marginal moment to a, a couple of percentage points were going for both or for two. But uh, it was, uh, just goes to show it's not as easy as you first think. Yeah, AI is becoming really believable nowadays. Cool, thank you. So um, coming back to the UDPR, which is not as exciting, I guess. Uh, transparency is one of its main principles um, and while the regulation is technology neutral and does not directly refer to AI or machine learning, it does have a significant focus on large-scale automated processing of personal data and several provisions specifically refer to automated decision making and profiling. So this means that it applies to the use of AI to provide a prediction or recommendation about individuals. More specifically, the GDPR has specific requirements around the provision of information about and an explanation of an AI-assisted decision where it is made by a process without any human involvement and it produces legal or similarly significant effects on an individual. So this would include something affecting an individual's legal status or rights or that has an equivalent impact on an individual's circumstances, behavior or opportunities. So for example, a decision about a loan. In these cases, the GDPR requires providing the individual an explanation of a fully automated decision to enable their rights to obtain meaningful information, express their point of view and contest the decision. But even where an AI-assisted decision is not part of a solely automated process because there is meaningful human involvement, if personal data is processed, it is still subject to the GDPR's principles. Transparency in particular is about being clear, open and honest with individuals about how and why you use their personal data. 
it is unlikely to be considered transparent if you're not open with individuals about how and why an AI-assisted decision about them was made or where their personal data was used to train and test an AI system. Finally, remember as well that, as noticed previously, generally generative AI models are pre-trained pre on a variety of publicly available sources from the internet and data subjects whose data has been used to train these systems are completely unaware. So there are inherent data protection concerns and companies need to assess these risks and adopt appropriate measures. Now, um, we're gonna be addressing a few more GDPR principles and in particular, Bharatip is going to address next the fairness and accuracy principles, I believe. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. So the GDPR's accuracy principle applies to all types of personal data, whether it is information about an individual used as an input to an AI system or to the output of the system. But this doesn't mean that the AI system will be 100% accurate. So by this I mean that in many cases the outputs are not intended to be treated as factual information about an individual. Instead, they are intended to represent a statistically informed guess as to something which may be true about the individual now or in the future. To avoid such personal data being misinterpreted as factual, you should ensure that your records and public facing documentation indicates that they are, they are informed guesses rather than actual facts. There may also be instances in which the AI system might hallucinate. This is when the system generates inaccurate or misleading outputs as if they were correct. This might cause some harmful consequences if the user takes the outputs at face value and believes them to be completely true. Also, as the AI system learns and trains from data, which may be unbalanced or reflects discrimination, they may produce outputs which reflect certain biases about people based on different characteristics, such as their gender, race, age, religion, or sexual orientation, or it might even amplify certain stereotypes. This can happen where certain groups are unrepresented or biases actually encoded within the data sets and algorithms used to train the model. AI learns by examples. If those examples contain certain types of biases or discrimination, the outputs are likely to resemble that. So just to provide you some examples, when, within Midjourney, a popular image generator, biases found when asked to create images of people in certain professions, it showed both younger and older people, but the older people happened to always be men. Also, as another example, in 2016, Tay, an AI chatbot developed by Microsoft, was designed to learn from conversations with users and became more human-like in its responses. However, however, within 24 hours of its launch, Tay began to tweet offensive and racist comments, which led to Microsoft shutting down the chatbot. There's also, there's also other examples of chatbots expressing political bias or AI systems spreading misinformation as well. So in the context of generative AI, the most important question is how the system is being used and whether it could potentially lead to harm caused by inaccurate or biased outputs. Given the uncertainty about possible outputs, it might be that generative AI cannot be considered completely trustworthy, but do remember that it does have a lot of benefits as well. So if you are an intermediary provider or deployer, it is important to provide a disclaimer to end users about the outputs that may be generated and have in place an acceptable use policy so that end users are aware of the ethical and responsible use of the AI system. Also, the GDPR provides individuals with various data subject rights, such as the right to access and delete your personal data. In practice, it may be difficult to respond to requests in the context of generative AI, given the way that the personal data is processed through the supply chain mentioned earlier by Richard and how personal data is processed within a black box. So individuals have the right to access and request copies of their personal data for both input and output data. Most AI systems are pre-tamed using substantial amounts of different types of data like text, videos, audio, and images consisting of both personal and non-personal data, as Andrea mentioned earlier. Practically speaking, it may be difficult, if not impossible, to trace and provide a copy of the specific individual's personal data from all the vast amount of data processed by the AI system to be able to fulfill an access request. Also, individuals have the right to request inaccurate personal data to be updated or corrected. As generative AI is trained using a vast amount of data, and as the model can often learn from inaccurate or false information, 
the if the individual wants their personal data to be corrected, it may be difficult to implement this because the information would need to be corrected within the training data itself. So, for example, the online article that we that was used to train the AI system. Individuals also have the right to request that the personal data be deleted from the system and the right to object to its processing. The challenge for deletion requests is essentially the same as access requests. If you're unable, una unable to look, actually locate and identify the user's information within a black box, then you're not able to delete their information. But please note that requests for access correction and deletion should not be regarded as manifestly unfounded or excessive just because they may be, an, may be harder to fulfill. Requests should be dealt with as best as possible in compliance with the GDPR. However, there may be times where it is not possible to identify the individual and therefore you may not be able to fulfill the request. The last right, automated decision making, is when individuals have the right not to be subject to decisions based on, based on automated processing that have legal or significant effects. For this right, it really depends on how the AI system is being used. Most AI systems generate different types of outputs back to the user, but do not actually make a decision about the user. However, there could potentially be scenarios where this right becomes relevant. For example, there may be an advice chatbot that interacts with the user and makes decisions that may have significant effects on the user, such as decisions consisting of financial opportunity losses. So it really does depend on the AI system and how it's used and if it does make any significant decisions. I will now pass over to Mark to speak about the governance and accountability principles. Thank you, Pardi. Um, I, I really like that phrase. It really does depend on the AI system that you're using. So I think context is everything uh, when we're thinking about risk and risk management. And one of the things, Europe, best practice, and uh, increasing laws and regulation around the world ask us to do when using technology, using data, and now using AI, is to be responsible for that use. And we're responsible in different ways. And then we get into to principles like governance and accountability. So governance, essentially building a system that provides a framework for managing activities within an organization, how you go about that. That may or may not be a legal task. That may well be a task for, for many stakeholders. But then also something we're probably more familiar with uh, those of us who are, um, you know, uh, either data privacy lawyers or data privacy adjacent, that concept of accountability, showing your working. My maths high school teacher was always interested in me showing how I would got to the answer I'd got to, because I may just get a few points along the way, even if I didn't get the right answer. It's almost the same where, with the regulation. How did you get to where you got to? Can you demonstrate uh, a level of oversight and, uh, and, a, and a level of understanding around the risks. So governance accountability are key topics in, uh, in AI and AI management. In fact, they're so key. On the 17th of April, uh, as I mentioned, Carlos from Spain and Kira from Ireland are going to be running a whole webinar on this. We've only got a slide on this today. And I was just going to highlight a couple of issues to, to some of you. Um, well, or to all of you, um, if you're all paying attention. So uh, risk assessment and risk management is one of the key issues. A lot of the time we spend talking about benefit of AI and the attraction of AI. But of course, as lawyers and uh, yeah, notably as some particular lawyers uh, who are you know, perhaps more pessimistic than often optimistic, um, with AI, you see risk. And of course, it's right to see risk, and it's risk in a legal sense, it's risk in a reputational sense, it's you know risk from uh, risk of extinction in some areas. If you're you know deeply deployed in SEO, um, you'll have found AI has already transformed a lot of your business, and, and and many other businesses are transforming. So a number of stakeholders are interested in assessing whether or not you should or shouldn't do something. And of course, just because you can doesn't mean you should. So making an assessment of the risks inherent within uh, within a certain activity and then what measures you might be able to put in place to mitigate against those measures is all important. We see that already prescribed under the GDPR with 
the requirements to do a data protection impact assessment when personal data processing is involved and there is a high risk to that data. Almost certainly the implementation of a generative AI system leveraging a lot of you know, personal data is going to trigger that obligation under the GDPR. It may well trigger other obligations under some of the new California rules, but also as a best practice, our Phil Fisher team has produced an AI impact assessment, something that we've been running with many, many businesses. And that looks at data risks, almost addressing all of those DPIA issues, but also wider risks. And if anybody wants to talk about or have a sample of that kind of approach, we'd be more than happy to talk about that. But risk assessment, then risk management is something you need to be thinking about. And that isn't always entirely a legal exercise. Risks. Um, so, it's also important. Um, the um, yeah, sorry, just had a little blip there. We thought we we thought we lost you, but oversight net mechanisms for ensuring responsible AI use. Uh, also important. Um, some initially, the oversight mechanism for AI was to simply restrict access or turn it off. Of course, that's one way of going about it, but quite quickly, your employees will find a way around it or uh, find a way to use AI. But also, as I was saying, if you don't adopt and you don't move ahead, it may well be you're faced with extinction or, or certainly a lack of competitiveness. So understanding how um, to implement AI, what framework you will use, and how you'll think about regular audit, ethical review, compliance checks, working with independent bodies or monitoring developments uh, will be important. There are a number of frameworks out there, um, the uh, NIST framework, the Singapore's AI Verify, and others, but just good methodologies for working and thinking about how you use AI responsibly, responsibly are important. As Richard said, Maybe with the EU AI Act, we'll see some codes of practice and other, uh, uh, other areas. But of course, a lot of AI, in fact, the majority of AI is not going to be caught by the EU AI Act. So we're all going to be looking at, uh, looking at building our own frameworks and our own responsibility mechanisms. And there's an art to doing that. Then, of course, using AI, there's good use and bad use of AI. And as I said, AI is just software. Software is just technology. For a long time, we've all thought about the issues of using technology in the right way. We have acceptable use policies, we have restrictions, we have security policies. We go out there and train our employees about what good would look like, what data management is good at a law firm, where we should keep client data and confidentiality and confidential data, where we shouldn't put it, how we should share, how we shouldn't share how we should log on in an encrypted way with dual factor authentication or, or, or how we should uh, print out and whether we should yeah, leave documents in certain places or file them away in secure filing cabinets. That is all about technology literacy. Of course, now you need AI literacy and training and it's essential component of that. Within Field Fisher, we have an AI task force. You now, one of the first things we've done is thought about AI literacy and training and embarking a upon you know, how to use it, how to use it in a safe way, and also training up so people have the skills to use it. I've seen so many examples of individuals go off, have a quick play with ChatGPT, determine it's useless and walk away. Yet those of us that have really spent time using some of these AI tools, use them day in, day out. In fact, there's barely a project you can embark upon these days without getting some benefit from an AI tool. So understanding that, understanding some of the biases human have, Humans are often trusting in technology too much. They stay, you know, they sense check just because a machine has done it, it, it's, it must be fine. But as Richard showed in some of those headlines at the beginning, people have been caught out, um, you know, something removing a human from the loop, removing that common sense check is also po possible. So governance and accountability, there's so much to be said there. And as I said, this series will come on and do more, but uh, really things you need to think about. And it's always the non-legal, the best practice and something where either you as a lawyer or you as a, uh, a, a manager or somebody responsible may have to bring together a number of stakeholders across an organization in order to govern, you know, to govern and provide the right kind of framework for managing AI use within your organization. Um, but yeah, more to be said on that. But Richard, maybe you know, we could go off and talk about some of the other 
you know, headline risks uh, and other issues that we see within AI. So today we've mainly been discussing the privacy risks and challenges around Gen AI, but don't forget there are many other issues to consider. Privacy is not the, the final word or the only issue um, by any stretch of the imagination. And here are just some examples of the other issues to consider, whether you are a developer or whether you are a user deployer of generative AI. Firstly, confidentiality. So in the context of Gen AI, confidentiality concerns arise from the use of potentially sensitive or proprietary data, including company secrets or private information as inputs to AI systems. Um, and there's also going to be an additional layer of complexity for businesses um, where they're using a generative AI that involves the processing of customer data. So not your own data, but third party and customer data for which you are a trusted custodian. And it's important to implement stringent uh, security measures to ensure that the information fed into these systems is securely processed and stored. Um, including things like establishing strict access controls, encrypting data, and ensuring that data usage complies with those contractual restrictions and um, there are appropriate guardrails around the use of the data by upstream providers. We also have concerns around IP and the creation and use of Gen AI systems often involves complex IP issues, particularly regarding the ownership of AI generated content, as well as the data used to train these systems. So an important thing to consider is clarifying a IP rights uh, in the context of Gen AI, and in particular, establishing the ownership of inputs, outputs, and the licensing model with the third parties that you're contracting with. And of course, we have liability concerns. And these arise particularly where Gen AI systems can produce erroneous outputs or can uh, create outputs that have the potential to cause harm. Party preferred earlier to um, a financial advice app or some form of chatbot that's providing um, assistance or advice in the context of financial services. You can imagine there that mistakes or erroneous outputs could lead to real world harms for individuals. So a key question is determining who is responsible for these kind of mistakes, the developer, the user, or maybe another party. So really, it's a key thing to think about how that liability is going to be mediated through your contracts and thinking about what kind of warranties, indemnities are going to be included, as well as what the insurance is in place and what insurance can cover. And uh, I think there's, there was a lot of discussion and uncertainty last year, and we might start to see increasingly over time standards and market practices about what kinds of assurances and guarantees providers are giving to users and how those liability um, are mediated through contracts. So again, just to briefly touch on the fact that there are other things to consider outside the world of privacy, and this is really going to take a more holistic approach to thinking about the risks around Gen AI. So we have now reached the final poll of our webinar. Just like before, which image do you think is fake out of these two and was generated by AI? Do you think it's number one, number two on the screens right now, or do you think both of these images are fake? Please use Slido, just like before, to provide your responses. What we'll do is just give a couple of minutes on this slide. So have a think and decide whether you want to vote for one, two, or both. And then I believe when we move on to the next slide, that's when you'll actually be able to input your vote. But we want to give you a moment to take a good look and decide <laughs> which you think could be AI. I think this one is going to be the most trickiest of the other two. Yes. Especially as we know that many people um, like to use a lot of Photoshop on their LinkedIn <laughs> profile pictures or their company pictures in any event. So sometimes no, that would never happen, Richard. <laughs> I can't believe people would adopt Certainly not with our pictures. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> All righty. Shall we start getting some votes? Yeah. 
for sure. All right, now's your opportunity. Interesting. Interesting, it keeps moving, um, but it seems the majority of attendees think that both images are fake. So um, it seems that the audience are getting every single poll right during this webinar. Um, the answer is that both images are actually fake. And this really does show how good AI, well, it isn't, well, AI is good, but I think there's still possibility that as we are able to still guess if it's fake or not. Mm. Yeah, but can they guess which of the presenters on this webinar was fake? <laughs> That's the big question. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, I guess we're, we're impressed that everybody got that answer right. So AI is not quite there yet, maybe in deceiving all of us, but consider this maybe just some training. In addition to some privacy training, we're getting some training on how to spot fake AI images, which is something we should become good at in the years ahead. And I think as time moves on, AI is just going to get better and better. So it'll be exciting to see what happens. Right, so we're coming towards the end of today's webinar and we thought we'd wrap up by thinking about some key questions that pulls together some of the issues and guidance that we've provided during the course of today's discussion. So let's zoom in on some key questions. Um, first of all, whether you are a provider or a user deployer of Gen AI, you've got to think about what is your processing role? Are you a controller, joint controller, or processor? And that's really fundamental because your role in the data processing ecosystem determines your compliance responsibilities. So think about, are you the key decision maker with respect to the data? Or are you a co-pilot in making decisions about how the data is collected and processed? Or are you merely executing orders and processing the data on behalf of another, for example, your customer? So again, that's a really foundational question to begin with. Secondly, what's your legal basis for processing? Under the GDPR, you always need to establish a lawful basis in order to process personal data. And particularly, that's going to be relevant for controllers who have to establish whether they're relying on a ground like consent, contractual necessity, legitimate interests, or another legal basis. And don't forget, you have to pin down a legal basis for each of your processing activities. So, for example, if you are involved in developing and building the Gen AI system, perhaps you're involved in fine tuning the model or otherwise processing personal data to develop that system, then you have to identify what is your lawful basis in that context. But separately, if let's say you're a user in the context of the live deployment of the system and the inputs and outputs that are being processed by the AI tool, again, what's your legal basis in that context? Third question, have you prepared a DPIA, a data protection impact assessment? That's a key aspect of accountability that uh, Mark discussed earlier. And under the GDPR, it's actually a mandatory requirement for high risk processing. Now, many cases involving Gen AI might not actually involve high risk processing, but again, it depends on context. And according to regulatory guidance, a DPIA is often going to be required if you are implementing new or novel technologies, particularly if it's a new scenario. So you could have an existing tool or an existing business process, but you are introducing Gen AI, adding a new layer of technology that could trigger the need to complete a DPIA. Fourth point, think about data subject rights. How are you going to comply with those rights requests? As a controller, that's going to be your direct responsibility to comply with an access, deletion, objection, etc. type of data request. But if you're merely a processor, think about how you are going to assist the controller and comply with their instructions in terms of identifying the data, locating the data, and then actioning the request, whether that's providing access or deleting it. Fifth question, are you going to be using generative AI to make automated decisions? Again, probably more limited number of cases where this is going to be relevant, but it's certainly a possibility. 
particularly as this concept of what is or is not an automated decision is still in flux and we have decisions from the Court of Justice of the European Union deciding that um, the generation of a probability value by a credit scoring agency could actually be um, within scope of automated decision making of the GDPR. So similarly, we might start to see new questions about when Gen AI could actually be involved in automated decision making. And very lastly, let's think about risks and how you're going to identify and manage those risks. How have you implemented policies and procedures to trigger the need to conduct assessments? Um, have you put in policies in place in order to mitigate those risks? And what kind of training are you providing to ensure that users know how Gen AI should be used responsibly? And that's really about laying the foundations for the responsible use of AI. So that gives you some key questions, which I think brings us neatly to the end of the session and at dead on time as well. So that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you very much to Richard, to Pardeep and to Andrea for, and to all of you for listening in today. Um, we, uh, we really appreciate that, appreciate all of this. Um, as you can see for our uh, Silicon Valley team, it's definitely not our first rodeo. It's definitely not our first experience in AI and we've got a lot to share, whether you're building, whether you're integrating or beginning to, to use and uh, use that AI. And of course, we've got a very rich and deep um, technology and AI team across our European offices as well. So please reach out to any of us, any of your familiar Field Fisher contacts if you have questions. We've got an AI regulatory guidebook looking at some of the issues that impact AI on a country by country basis. You can click on the link here when you get the slides or again, let us know. Of course, we've got our data privacy webpage, our um, privacy blog, and we'll be making these webinars and other webinars available via our privacy YouTube for, and look out there for other GDPR webinars, technology and AI series throughout this link. And of course, just one final and shameless plug, um, we've got our two additional webinars coming up, 12th of March on assessing high risk in AI systems. And then finally, on the 17th of April, AI governance, what it is and what it should never be. So please join us again. Thank you for listening. We'll get back to our sunny day and maybe grab a coffee. And uh, we wish you the best of luck with the rest of yours. Thank you from Silicon Valley. <laughs>